Like with all the concepts that we've discussed throughout the series, we'll begin with a definition of organizational change. Broadly speaking, we should think about organizational change as any alterations in the people, structure, or technology of an organization. But let's look more closely at what all of this can mean. When we're talking about changes in people, it's not just that we get new people, have some people leave for any reason, it's also talking about meaningful changes in attitudes, expectations, perceptions, and behaviors. For example, one of the challenges in any organization is managing across generations because there's some different expectations from any generation about work, their work environment, communication, professionalism, and the like. As those expectations change, so too must organizations. Similarly, the social and economic environment will also change. Before the COVID pandemic, very few people really considered working at home for office jobs. During the pandemic, we've all had to do that. And after the pandemic, the interesting question will be how organizations change to accommodate perhaps new preferences for working, new space needs, and certainly new technology. Both during and after the pandemic, the attitudes of, about all of that will illustrate people-centered change. Second, just like people and their attitudes or behaviors change, so do the structures of organizations. Throughout the series, one of the things that we've highlighted is that organizations are increasingly flat in their structures. The shift from hierarchical organizational structures with lots of layers of management to organizations with working teams and fewer managers has all constituted meaningful structural change over time, and that affects the ways that people work. Similarly, in the last 15 to 20 years, we've also seen organizations increasingly adopting network or geographically dispersed structures so that they could serve a variety of stakeholders in multiple locations. As an additional change that could happen that affects the structure of an organization, if we increasingly move online and to online modes of working in office jobs, the reliance on these kind of network structures of organizations will also change, prompting even more types of changes, more diversity in how we see work, and really the way that we experience in terms of typical office jobs, the working environment. Third, technology is often a routine, but challenging change that gets introduced in organizations. Now here I'm not necessarily talking about the massive kinds of changes that accompany a situation like COVID-19, but even more standard changes like rollouts of new software, new desktop setups, new technology related practices. All of this can often be challenging and meet with a lot of resistance in organizations. But when we're thinking of technology, we really should think about three types of people. The first are the early adopters. These are folks who want to have the latest and greatest. They're the first ones to have the smartwatch or whatever new gadget comes out. Second are medium adopters. And these are folks who aren't resistant to new tools and technology, but they like to wait and see what sticks, wait for the bugs to be worked out, wait to really see if the tools themselves are reliable and useful before adopting them. So as a Gen Xer, I watch the beta max rollout happen in the mid 1980s. My uncle was an early adopter. He bought the Betamax and then it ultimately lost out to the VCR. My dad was a medium adopter and so we waited, rented videos in the machines and ultimately bought a VCR. Now for those of you who are too young to know what the Betamax was, just Google it. It's a great example though of the rationale that medium adopters will use for how they view new technology adoption. Then the third category, the late adopters. These are often people who just don't like and typically resist new technology. While they may be people who generally don't like change, it's more likely that it's, it's more about the technology itself. So imagine that if an organization is rolling out new tools and technology, you don't have to spend a lot of time with the early adopters. You do need to craft a uh, campaign really to persuade the medium adopters why it's a good or useful change. And then you have a little bit more work to cut it to do in order to deal with and help manage the change with the late adopters. 
While some changes can be planned and introduced slowly, that's not the case in most situations. For a whole host of reasons, organizational change is often not managed as a routine part of simply improving organizations. It's typically reactionary to specific circumstances and specific situations within an organization or its environment that is really forcing things to happen and forcing changes. This means that a lot of changes are fairly sudden increasingly frequent and often pretty complex. For managers, communicators, and employees, what I'd call adaptability or agility within the organization is critical to helping change be successful. But in order to do that, we have to understand some of the characteristics of change. There are three principal characteristics of change that create the unique challenges that change brings to organizations. First, the old adage that the only thing constant is change is actually pretty true. However, whether it's slow and gradual so that we don't really notice it, or whether it's punctuated and severe will really depend on the situational circumstances. But because the world is constantly changing, so too are our organizations, organizational practices, and the communication needs around them. It's just that we may not notice so much. Second, one of the reasons that change can be so difficult is that it often produces uncertainty. And let's face it, most people just don't like uncertainty. And yeah, there is a, this operates on a sliding scale, and it'll depend on the degree to which we as individuals avoid uncertainty. But we can emotionally and psychologically react to change pretty negatively because we just don't know how things are going. So in an organizational setting, if everything is comfortable, easy, and positive, people often view the opportunity cost of change as being too high. This is why organizational change tends to accompany tumultuous periods, because when things are going badly, people are more willing to try something different, just because they perceive the opportunity cost or risk as being lower, they have less to lose. And that leads to the third characteristic. No matter the reason for change, there will always be threats and opportunities that arise from the change. For example, if you're changing job, which can be a major change for some people, some of the threats can include moving house, leaving family and friends, going into a new environment where we don't know people, and the potential that the new job may actually be worse than the old job. However, each of these can be flipped as also being the opportunities associated with a new job, new places, new people, better opportunities. Whether we do it formally or informally, when there are major changes, we tend to think in terms of this cost-benefit analysis, or in PR terms a lot of times, around a SWOT analysis, considering the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the situation. At this point in the lecture series, you probably won't be surprised to hear me say that how we handle change is skill related. And so with time, practice and recognition of the types of skills to improve how we manage both stress and change, we can actually improve at managing change for ourselves and for our organizations. So let's consider for a moment, as we're trying to understand change, how you react to change.
Now, you should have a list of words that you wrote down. The way to score it is straightforward. For each word that you wrote down in green, give yourself a plus 10 per word. For each word that you wrote down that's in red, give yourself a minus 10. There's no score for the words in black. Take a couple of minutes to add up your score. This slide will stay up for two minutes, starting now. Okay, so here's how we see how you did. This inventory gives you an idea about when it comes to major changes, how you might embrace them. Of course, the change inventory works better when you have a very specific change in mind. For example, moving, starting a new job, adopting some particular new technology, getting a boss, and so on. However, this is a tool you can use in any situation to gauge how well people might react to the changes. It's one that I've used in organizations when I've been helping with change initiatives, so it's a simple exercise that I like to go through, just like this, or sometimes online or in paper form, depending on the context, to get people's reactions to the specific change that's being re discussed and, and reviewed. This helps me and the organization to get a better understanding of the disposition that people might have to help the organization be better able to adapt to employees' information needs and levels of support or resistance for the change. It's not too surprising then that what we do with the kind of information we get from tools like the resistance to change inventory is to develop a change management strategy. In a formal way, we should think of change management as a structured approach to shifting the status quo to a desired future. This means that it's a process aimed at helping employees accept and embrace the changes that are coming. So this is one of the reasons why the communications function is central. When you look at change management, it should look pretty much like any other strategic communication campaign that we might have. Now, of course, successful change management is the outcome or the objective that we're trying to achieve. But when we develop a strategy, organize the information, work to motivate people, support teamwork, identify improvements that can be made, and most of all, measure and implement the change itself and the outcome success, we get a sense of how the process works from start to finish. In a lot of ways, of course, this is easier said than done. So let's take a look at some of the critical components and forms that change can take. In order for any change management strategy to be successful, we have to have change agents. These are people that help ensure the change itself is successful. And it's really to note that these people don't necessarily need to be managers. They can literally be anyone both inside and outside the organization. However, to be an effective change agent, they need to have four characteristics. 
First, they must be culturally sensitive. This goes beyond political correctness and, and that kind of sense of cultural sensitivity, but it talks all about a lot of the concepts we've discussing throughout this series, that successful change agents make people feel included, that they're other oriented, and that they understand how different perspectives influence people's ability or willingness to adopt change. Second, they must be entrepreneurially minded, which means that they need to be innovative and they need to be resilient. In this case, what I'm talking about in terms of resilient is that they have to be able to cope well with hearing and managing people's criticisms, worries, and concerns. They can't be too bothered with rejection and frustration. So being entrepreneurial in this context means that they're likely to persevere even where there are setbacks and take different approaches to helping the change be successful. Third, they need to be active learners. This means that they have to have high levels of self-awareness, demonstrate flexible thinking, and frankly, be able to help others at the skill sets required for the change to be successful, whether those are practical skills or soft skills like communication. Finally, and I cannot emphasize this enough, they have to be socially responsible. This means they have to be stakeholder focused, and that can mean internal or external stakeholders, but so while they have to have the commitment to results and the entrepreneurial attitude, they cannot view the result of the successful change as the only thing that's valuable. They have to get everyone there too. We know that change management's a lot like a campaign. We know that we need people to help implement it successfully, but what forms can it take in organizations? There are three forms that are typically explored in the change management literature. The first is an often ideal type of change, plan change, where whatever new people, structures, technology, or approaches are implemented, they're done in a non-emergency or non-crisis context. So Lewin's model for plan change is one of the most typical models that's introduced, and it begins with the assumption that as people are going along in their organizational environment, they're probably relatively content about it because they're not in a stage of emergency. So it emphasizes that change shouldn't be implemented without first what he calls the unfreeze phase, which is one that ensures that employees are actually ready for the change. So the unfreeze can involve a communication campaign to identify and persuade people about the need for change, the benefits of change, and even get feedback that helps to adapt the changes to the organizations. A lot of times this is when employees are consulted about the ideas that management has and have the opportunity to feed back and even revise the plans. Now, depending on the size and the scope of the change, the unfreeze phase can be pretty short or it could even take years. The second phase is when the change actually occurs. So whatever was introduced, revised and decided on during the unfreeze phase is implemented. Here, attention is focused on ensuring that people are able to execute the change, have the skills to do it, are supported throughout the way, and there's ongoing persuasion that despite any short-term hassles, the organization is moving forward. Again, depending on the size and scope, this can take a matter of days to a matter of years. And finally is the refreeze stage, where change agents help to ensure that all the practices, relevant daily routines and tools to maintain the changes that were implemented are placed and commonly in practice so that whatever is changed becomes the new routine. If the refreeze phase isn't successful, then oftentimes the changes will roll back because people never actually implemented them into their regular routines. So let me give you an example of this process in action. When I was in Texas, I consulted for applied materials. And I think I've mentioned this before, but the project was to give their, was in their accountancy division, and I was brought in as the communication consultant when they were rolling out a major new piece of software and an entirely new approach to accounting in order to bring the global organization of applied materials in line with major legislation in the US. So what we did at the beginning was to invite the change agents or leads from the 12 or so different countries and both of the U.S. site locations to Austin for a conference to begin un the unfreezing phase. The purpose of the three-day conference was to introduce them to the tools, but most importantly persuade these change agents that this was going to improve their jobs, transparency, and accountability in the process, improving the overall organizational health. 
From there, over the next year, the rollout phase of the software was done globally with representatives from the software company spending time in each location training managers and current employees on all the new processes, the new program, answering questions, and ensuring that they would be successful. That was the change process. Then, for the year after that, the software company was available for additional support for employees, and the change agents were especially vigilant about compliance, support, and all the accountancy systems, making sure that those were all converted into the new software with the checks at multiple levels for compliance and effectiveness until the systems were fu fully and finally integrated. Unplanned change, however, is more often the norm these days, and it's all based on reactions to uncertain environments. So it's reactionary instead of proactive. Now, this can be small things like reacting to changing employee demographics and new norms. For example, in the US with the millennials and their, we'll say, excessive parental involvement in their lives, HR policies in many organizations were updated so that parents could call HR to check up on their kids, accompany them to interviews, and generally have greater access to information about them at work. No, I'm not joking on that either. However, it could be more serious and relate to performance gaps by organizations or employees, to new regulations like the software I was talking about with applied materials, changes in the competitive landscape, and of course, crises. The process for implementing change isn't all that different from Lewin's model. There's still a need to ready employees for it, implement the change, and then reinforce it, but the unplanned nature of the change often means there's less opportunity to ready employees for the change in an unfreeze phase and a much greater focus on the change and reinforcing the change. The third form of change is radical or transformational change. This is a form of planned change, but it can also be a reaction to major uncertainties in an organization's environment. What makes it different is that most change is relatively minor. Tinkering around the edges might be a new piece of software. Radical change represents a process to regain a competitive advantage after a loss or a serious threat and involves core changes in the organization's processes, systems, structures, and or even core values. So examples of these can include mergers, acquisitions, restructuring whole divisions, redundancies, changes in people's roles and responsibility. Anything and everything is on the table. So while the process isn't necessarily appreciably different from Lewin's plan change model, the implications of the volume or the mass of the change means that the organization is probably going to be operating in an entirely new way in some capacity. So everything is amplified and not surprisingly, people's concerns are often higher because their jobs are probably on the line. So when we think about organizational change, we should think of it as an inherently communication driven process. And in the next couple of podcasts, we'll get further into that.